Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News. This week in Waltham, the City Council had their special midsummer meeting that included uh, special meetings of several of their committees. So we'll tell you more about that. Uh, one of those was rules and ordinances um, discussing cannabis dispensaries. So James was there, so he'll tell us a little, but we're also going to have uh, an, an old friend, an old member of our team who was in one of the first channel 781 videos, uh, Emily Superior will be here to uh, give us a little bit more background on what's going on with the cannabis dispensaries. They also have the special joint meeting with the Historical Commission to talk about the Fernald, so we'll tell you about that. They had the first meeting of the new committee having to do with recording and captioning of meetings, so we'll tell you about that. And then we don't have uh, detailed stories on these, but we just wanted to mention two other things that happened. Um, they'd had an executive session about the Fitch School, so we don't know what happened in that. And they confirmed the new fire chief, Andrew Mullen. So congratulations to the new fire chief. I am here with Chris Gamble. Hello, everyone. And James Kerkelis. Hello, everyone. And if I'm going to talk about community events, thank you to um, Hammer Patriot, who has put up the list on Reddit for August. August. So if you any of the events I'm about to read uh, uh, sound interesting, you can get more information on the Waltham subreddit. Um, this Saturday, August 6th, the Waltham Library is having a dance party with special guests. Next Tuesday, the 9th, Waltham Community Fields, uh, Waltham Fields Community Farm is having picnic supper on the farm. Um, the Girl Scouts are having on August 14th a National S'mores Day celebration at Camp Cedar Hill. The Mighty Squirrel is having an Ales for ALS event. That's a, a fundraiser for AZ, um, ALS on August 19th. Um, that's a Friday. On Saturday, August 20th, the Mayor's Annual Doo-Wop Concert is happening. I was not familiar with this, but apparently it did happen last 2019. And Martha Reeves and the Vandellas were the guests, which I didn't know about, but I'm kind of impressed. So it hasn't been announced yet who the, the guest is for this year. Um, I laugh when I first saw it because, I'm, of course, I'm picturing the mayor singing doo up, but she's not the singer. The singer could be someone interesting, so we'll stay tuned to hear more about that. Uh, the Waltham Farmer's Market is ongoing on Saturdays on Moody Street. The Waltham Arts Council Summer Concert Series is ongoing on Tuesday evenings on the Common. The Waltham Trail Runners meetups are ongoing. For September, a reminder, the primary is on September 6th, if you want to vote in the primary. Um, Waltham Day on the Common is September 17th. The Phantom Gourmet Food Festival on Moody Street is September 24th. And the Motorheads Car Show, which is a, fun, uh, a classic car show that's a fundraiser at Gore Place, is also on September 24th. Now, uh, to help us get a little bit more background on the dispensaries issue, here is an old friend, an old member of our team, um, Emily Superior, who has been following the uh, cannabis dispensaries issue here in Waltham very closely for uh, several years and has helped me keep up to date on it. But tonight we decided it would be better to just let her tell you about it. Um, and so we could ask her some questions. So welcome, Emily. Hello. Thanks for being here. So before we go to Emily James, can you just give us a summary of what happened at this week's meeting? Sure. So this was another meeting where they had uh, representatives from all of the shops there, and this was a me this was a meeting that wasn't scheduled at a set time. It was set at uh, after the council meeting, which meant that all of the uh, uh, the the uh, dispensary owners and their lawyers were standing around for hours before the meeting even started and then wrapped up at like midnight <laughs> so that's it was interesting to observe uh most of the back and forth that this particular meeting was about the specifics of like the 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 individual shops like layout it changes to their design and like the implications for that so like one of the dispensaries was they were talking about getting a feedback from the legal department about whether or not it would need a um, uh, another public hearing, for example, and uh, they then scheduled another meeting on the twenty second, where they're going to have all these people back in again to go to, to hear more about it. And they also had uh, the lawyer, the city lawyer, in ta talk about the um, uh, the new law that had uh, been passed. So, yeah, that's basically the short of it. 
Thank you, James. And yeah, so actually about the new law, um, I had mentioned this two weeks ago. I did a correction last week saying it actually hadn't passed yet, but it actually did pass just before this meeting. So Emily, can you catch us up on that? What does the new law do and, and why was that relevant to this meeting? Sure. Yeah. Well, a lot of the meeting last night ended up um, focusing on the meeting and catching up some of the counselors on how that impacts the work they're doing. Um, so the legislation that was passed um, just passed yesterday, very, I think, just after midnight on August 1st, um, is an act relative to equity in the cannabis industry. It was passed in um, both House and Senate went to Baker's desk, he's expected to sign it. It's a bit of a compromise in terms of what some of the social equity advocates wanted, but it is expected to be signed by Baker. Um, some of the ways that came up last night and some of the ways it's relevant to the ways that rules and ordinances is doing their work is um, that it caps the um, amount that a host community agreement can collect in terms of um, community impact fees at 3%. Um, so that's something that's been um, on my mind and I've been wondering if it's been on any of the counselors minds. Certainly I, I see it, it's been on our city solicitors minds as um, assistant city solicitor Lockman was, had an opportunity to to clarify indeed um, when it came up, um, I think it was Councilor LeBlanc asked, uh, he had not been at the previous special meeting of rules and ordinances where um, attorneys uh, for the dispensaries and city council worked out that they would um, recoup traffic impact fees. This new law says you actually can't um, specify more than 3%. In addition to that, um, the law specifies that the Cannabis Control Commission will now have more oversight in over the HCAs and in fact, we'll be reviewing um, each community, host community agreement, um, both uh, those in existence and those um, that are in the works. Um, so they'll all get a close look, and that's important because there actually has been um, some criminal investigations um, in terms of corruption, bribes um, in relation to host community agreements. And they really spent a long time, especially catching up counselors that hadn't been at the previous meetings this summer, explaining that, no, um, the, the money that's going to be used for this traffic mitigation cannot come from any sort of separate pot, pun intended, other than um, you know this three percent community impact fee, which will be designated in the host community agreement, and it, the assistant city solicitor also clarified that the host community agreement cannot be um, or has not been formalized yet and will not be until the permits are approved. So there's a, a lot of clarification last night, really. Thank you. So about the host community agreements, our understanding was that that was the next stage of the process. Once they get their special permits, they move on to negotiating that with the mayor. But then I remember at a previous meeting, there was a comment that led us to believe that maybe actually one business um, already has a host community agreement. And I'm not sure if we got any more um, information about that last night. What is your understanding of that? It sounds like uh, it sounds like we have made someone who can speak to that, Chris. Uh, yeah, we actually, um, James and I chatted with a lawyer for one of the cannabis commissions during the executive session. And we were chatting and I brought up the fact that we had heard through the grapevine that one of the um, one of the applicants already had a community host agreement and they said that they had heard that that was just for medicinal um hmm. a, a medicinal license and they were just as they were in the, the pot as well of uh, people seeking uh, adult Interesting. Interesting. yeah and i think that was middlesex integrative medicine but they're still stalled out because they've gone for adult use as well is it your impression that um 
the council has been working with the mayor in a way where once they announce who they're giving the special permits to, the mayor will be on board with doing host agreements, or do you think that'll be a completely separate decision-making process? Um, but that will, will, uh, will we be sort of starting over with the mayor when it comes to that process? Um, my hot take, just based on what the the language the counselors used last night is that um, one thing may not have a lot to do with the other, except that the permitting is the first required step. Um, and I, th I think if anything, the new state legislation will will be the piece that has the most impact. The executor on the host community agreements, which in our case is the mayor, will have a closer eye from the Cannabis Control Commission on essentially just getting this done. It, it's now written into this new legislation that Baker's about to sign. Do you think that's what's been motivating the council to get this, to meet over, over the summer about this and move this forward? That I don't know. Um, Councillor Harris has been the one counselor who's really, and more recently, um, started to put a flame under this item. That pun was not intended. Um, but, but whatever my disagreements may be with her decisions, I think she is bright, and I think she realizes that this needs to happen for someone like her who may have other political aspirations. It might behoove her to get something done. Um, so I guess that is some speculation. Does the new legislation put any uh, time limits on like the uh, host community agreements that need to get made or like anything like that? It, it, it does to the extent that but um, specifically in terms of the community impact fees, they can only be co collected over eight years. And so I, th I, I think, and I would need to verify, I think that goes retroactively. So if a dispensary opened, I don't remember, off, you know, if any actually opened in 2016, but if you're going up on eight years, then, you know, you're off the hook and um, you know, we start from day one if if you're a new dispensary. Thank you. Any speculation on what will happen at their next meeting? Um, yes. Based on what was said last night, in particular by Councillor Harris, um, and an exchange with uh, Uma Flowers' attorney, um, it does sound like it is possible that with these minor tweaks, which really focused on planting more trees and um, some tweaks to just getting the language exactly right, nitpicky stuff for better or worse, um, uh, that all five of these dispensaries are eligible if they you know, now do these just final last draft tweaks to their permits um, and have them just everything perfect at this August 23rd meeting that they've scheduled now, August 23rd at 6.30 p.m. We could have four out of those five businesses um, seeking or, you know, coming out with permit approval at the end of that meeting. That's that's not a definite. I think it's a possibility ability, partially because of the state pressure um, and partially because there's just nothing else to be done at this point. They're quibbling over what species of trees are being planted. The, uh, it is getting less and less defensible to have all these lawyers milling around for hours and hours just for not nothing, no actionable items coming out of meetings. Speaking of uh, lawyers, um, during that conversation James and I had with um, one of them, he was saying, and Emily, I'm curious um, if you think this is true, he was saying that although four out of the five applicants could acquire the special permits, they were saying that not all of them will necessarily get a community host agreement from the mayor. I think, and especially up until the passage of this new, um, this new bill, this new state bill, 
that has been a real possibility. Um, I think now, especially because this ability focuses on social equity and we do have at least one social equity applicant, I think on paper, there's more than one. I think it would be indefensible for the executor on our host community agreements, who's mayor, to deny a social equity applicant with an absolutely perfect permit with a uh, you know, successful um, business in Pepperell um, to deny them an HCA. Um, I don't know quite as much about the other businesses, but at this point, they have satisfied um, so many requests. It was the uh, dispensary that was going to be on, I think, the main street that had the question come up about its uh, uh, layout changes and if it needed to have a uh, uh, another public hearing as a result. <laughs> and that, that got sent to the legal department to ask for a response before the 22nd. So out of... I think it sounds like that's the, probably the least likely to get an approval. Yeah, I cut that briefly. I think between that and um, the Ward 7 Councilor Kate sending a letter um, saying, genuinely, we don't want this in our backyard for reasons unidentified other than the community is healing. It seems that it is the unpopular business. And I think it will not come as a surprise if we get four dispensaries that are as far away from the main drag, so to speak, as possible, or four or fewer. It doesn't seem like a coincidence. The one that there is any concerns about is the one that's on Main Street. Agreed. Emily, while we have you here, can you just speak generally to how you've been feeling about recreational marijuana in Waltham because we worked together on social equity provisions back in 2018. Yeah. Um, and while I pretend to uh, pay attention to these meetings, you've been keeping a very close eye on uh, recreational marijuana, especially. Um, can you just speak very generally about how you're feeling about how Waltham did? Terrible, just like point blank terrible. And, and I won't say in particular recreational or medical. So two prong answer. Number one, having worked on the social equity amendment, which did pass in city council, um, it was given a two year restriction and those two years have expired. So there's no more social equity language or any social equity regulations required in Waltham. So I felt good that it was passed, but time has just marched on and that's out the window. As a patient, I feel terrible because, you know, personal disclosure, I had surgery. You know, you all know this, but the viewers don't necessarily. I had surgery last summer. I, I used cannabis instead of opioids, which I didn't want to use for a whole variety of reasons. It was a pain in the butt to, in recovery, um, with minimal mobility to um, obtain what was medicine for me, um, you know, not nearby. Um, and I think that's a common experience. Um, and I think there's a lot to say for what's going on with quote unquote big cannabis and, you know, how it's just really Become, become another horrible industry, but there's also a lot to say for allowing people access to something that people genuinely use medicinally and people are legally or allowed to use recreationally as well. I'm glad that the state agrees that there needs to be closer eyes on what these municipalities are doing. Definitely, I think Waltham, will be remembered as a city that really dragged their feet when it came to this, really dragged their feet. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really helpful. You kind of got us caught up on a bunch of confusing issues at once. I appreciate it. And hopefully we'll have you back sometime soon. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Great night. Thank you.
so also um, at these during these special committee meetings, as we've talked about extensively on the show, the effort to get all of the city council meetings recorded and captioned, um, you re remember one of the developments was that the mayor allocated some money to that and then uh, the committee was established to manage that. So they had their first uh, meeting last night um, and Chris was there. Chris, can you tell us more about it? Yes, so I recorded this meeting and I'm uh, literally right now uh, putting it on Waltham data. The audio is not great uh, because we don't have microphones on city councilors, but uh, to give a short uh, debrief on it. Um, this was the first meeting of the WCAC budget appropriation. I forget the actual title. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a little interesting. Um, Karen Dunn is chairing it. It's the first committee that she's chaired. Um, it makes sense because she has background in videography. Um, and so the things that we learned uh, were, first of all, the reason they were there is that they were allocating um, a small amount of money because um, the WCAC director came in and said that uh, the server upgrade that they were going for is going to cost um, a little uh, more than they had initially planned um, because of supply chain issues, I think. Um, and so uh, once they get that money, this was asked by um, Patrick O'Brien, uh, they said they would be recording the committees very soon, which is like a terrible answer because it means nothing. It could mean anything, uh, but it seems to be that we're going to be uh, doing this very soon. Uh, we also learned from the director that all of the committees that are in the full chamber um, will be recorded live, which is great news, um, but all of the committees that are in the Hoover room will not be recorded live. I believe she used the word can't. You know, they asked for a sizable amount of money to upgrade their servers um, to hold these uh, committees online. Um, and I always thought that was weird. And it was brought up by George Darcy uh, meetings ago about how it's really only 20 six meetings a year additionally. Um, and so they, again, brought it up that they needed this money to upgrade their servers because they can only hold those things for six months um, on their website because of their server. And George uh, Darcy uh, asked, um, with your upgraded server, how long are you gonna hold these uh, committees on the website for? And she said, oh, we're gonna keep it at six months. So I'm not really sure what we're upgrading their servers for if it's gonna be the exact same amount of time, um, which I thought was uh, interesting. Um, but it's moving forward. Um, first meeting of this uh, went well, and I really truly do think soon these, all of these meetings will be recorded and me and James will never have to go again. Interesting, thank you. Was there any discussion of captions? No discussion on captions at all. So my comment on this, I'm glad it's moving forward, but First of all, it's not impossible to live stream something from the Hoover Room. It may be, it's probably not possible with the equipment they have currently and probably changing their equipment would be expensive. But this director keeps coming in and instead of saying that would be expensive, here mu here's how much I think it would cost. She just says, no, we can't do it. And that's really frustrating when they've set aside a pretty um, substantial pot of money for this. The whole business with the servers it is nonsense because the server space becomes less expensive all the time. Um, and the amount of money that they're paying an employee to go through and keep track of which videos have been on for six months and delete them, the amount of money they're paying that employee is probably more than the cost of the server space they're saving by doing that. That's a really weird practice for anyone to do in this day and age. And it's very arbitrary that she said, we're not doing more than six months, even though, as you said, so I'm frustrated with the WCAC director, but, and I've called her out before, but I don't, this time I don't want to call her out. I want to call out her boss, uh, Justin Barrett. So Justin Barrett recently received the Ritzy uh, committee, uh, the Ritzy award from the city council for his service to our community. He's the head of the board of WCAC. I've contacted him to ask him why they don't caption their content and he hasn't responded. Um, he's also very involved in the Lions Club and the Lions Club is the organization that's held holiday light celebrations at the Fernald for two years. There were protests and as far as I know there was no response to the protest. Neither the mayor or the Lions Club ever put out a statement saying here's why we think it's okay 
um, to do this at the Farnold, and regardless of what their reasons might be, lack of response is concerning. Um, and those are two issues that affect the disability community that uh, Justin Barrett has refused to respond to. And I would like to challenge him to respond to them publicly. The other reason this is important is because Mr. Barrett still plays a role in the Fernald, we found out at this meeting, which I'll be summarizing soon, um, as the head of the CPC, which purchased the Fernald, he still plays a role in this story of it being reused. And so to have somebody who is so conspicuously ignoring the concerns of the disability community, I think he needs to answer to it. I need to think he needs to say something publicly about it. And if he doesn't, I think Councillor Harris does because she pushed for through this award for him um, in a not very transparent manner that we've discussed before. And uh, I would like to know if she if she's is in fact planning on running for mayor. She seems like somebody who would be interested in having the support of the disability community. So I think this needs to be addressed. So that's my comment on that. And any other comments? It seems rather arbitrary to have like a six month timeout on like video, like things like that's basically, that's, especially considering how few of them there are. And that like, uh, there is so many options for video hosting that are online that are like, obviously not like, you know, a professional like IT solution or whatever, but like there's there's something some diff, something between like you know a zero dollar solution and the however much money they've allocated, which is like honestly kind of a lot at this point. Yeah, and, and that's what's frustrating is there was even way back in the middle of this process, there was one meeting where the committee, um, the Econ and Community Committee, uh, they were expecting her to show up, the director of CAC, she didn't come and they had this whole conversation about we need to just get this done, we'll just use another vendor if we have to. And then something happened behind the scenes where it was just decided that no, WCAC is doing it. And then she came in to kind of negotiate with them what she was willing to do. And so it's kind of like, like they're saying certain things instead of just saying we can't do that have someone else do it they're saying we can do that but we're going to keep fighting back on every detail and telling you certain details are impossible rather than just giving you a quote which would then provide the the reason for you to go to someone else so i think it's really a problem there's no good reason um, why WCAC has caused this to take so long and i think um, the head of the board justin barrett should should say something about it um, so the other thing that happened in this special meeting, which I was looking forward to because I think it's an interesting issue, is uh, there was the joint meeting between um, the council and the historical commission with the mayor that the mayor had requested um, having to do with the Fernal property. And before this meeting, WCAC came out with some new information about what the mayor has planned. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, this is their post uh, about uh, what is planned for the Fernal. And this was a design that was put forward by the engineering firm that the mayor hired. And uh, you may remember I told you about a public meeting they had back in January. Um, this plan has apparently been approved by the Recreation Commission. I don't know when that happened. I didn't know that there was a meeting about this, um, but this is apparently a done deal that this plan has been approved and uh, is now out for bid. Um, so as you can see, it's a plan to uh, redo not the entire property, but a very large chunk of it with all different kinds of recreational amenities, things like disc golf, exercise stations, a skating track. There's also a fairly large area that's gonna be left sort of undeveloped as a nature area, which is exciting. Um, so yeah, this is a really ambitious plan. Um, it would be really exciting. I think between this and the rail trail, it would you know, put Waltham way ahead of our neighbors in terms of the type and variety of public space we have. Um, one thing I noticed, which was interesting about this plan though, is they said they're going to have a meditative labyrinth, memorial and walks, braille walk, honoring Fernald residents. So this seems to be the answer to the question of will there be a memorial, but it doesn't tell us very much. Um, at first glance, a braille walk seems like a, this was a, an institution for people with intellectual disabilities. So a braille walk seems like an odd way to honor them. It seems like braille is something that should just be on signs anyways. But I don't know, maybe this is a beautiful idea. They don't tell us very much about it here. Um, and as far as I know, there wasn't any involvement from the disability community 
community in coming up with this plan so far. I had mentioned in a previous show, I talked to the director of the Mass Arc, who was interested in meeting with the Recreation Department, but that didn't happen before this plan um, got passed. Um, so then in the meeting, um, the mayor actually wasn't there to ask them about this plan. She was there to ask the Council and the Historic Commission um, if they would agree on changing a memorandum of understanding they approved uh, a long time ago to uh, declare that 12 buildings on the site probably cannot be restored and will eventually need to be demolished. So she wants them to look through that list of 12 buildings and tell her if they have any concerns about that. Some of the councillors and one of the historical commission members did raise three specific buildings um, that they thought should be partially um, or totally uh, preserved, and that's the admin building, um, which is the one you've seen if you look up a picture of the Fernald online. There's also the West building and the Waverly building. I wasn't able to find pictures of those, um, but uh, they are planning a site visit. That's one thing that came out of this meeting, so maybe we'll get some pictures of those buildings out of the site visit. Um, Councillor Darcy raised those buildings and mentioned their architectural value. One of the members of the Historical Commission, um, Rachel Migdal, um, made a comment about perhaps the facade of one of those buildings could be um, preserved, and she mentioned that she wanted to learn more about it because it was possible that the, some of the stones in this building were laid by the people who lived at Fernald. And she was the only one in this meeting who made any reference to people who lived at Fernald. Even, you know, Councillor Darcy, who's been kind of a champion of this, he kind of framed the historical things in terms of like an architectural concern. So to me, that was the most important part of the meeting. And I, I'm very happy with um, that historical commissioner that she brought that up. Um, but it seems like the mayor is not asking for their opinion on these recreational amenities. Councillor LeBlanc actually started to bring it up and she told him not to. She said that wasn't the top, that was off topic. Um, so I think that if the council and the historical commission want to make sure that the site is memorialized appropriately, um, they're going to need to use this request about the buildings as less leverage to force a conversation about what's going on um, with these memorial type things on the property because that affects the overall plan for how we're memorializing the site, which might include a preserving certain buildings. Um, so I hope Councillor Cates, who, who brought this up as um, one of his campaign issues, um, and specifically will do that, will we'll try to get an assurance that the disability community will play a role in designing these memorials. Um, the mayor also brought up a lot of other interesting information that I don't think a lot of people knew. For example, one part of the, the site has been looked at it by an archaeologist to make sure it wasn't a uh, a, a grave site, um, not the whole site, but a specific part that they were concerned about. She mentioned that there have been many uh, studies done on the site at different times, including when they were looking at it, using it for a high school. And actually, one of the members of the Historical Commission asked if they could get access to those studies. And she said, I thought you already had that. And he said, no, I was given it by the CPC head, Justin Barrett, and he told me I wasn't allowed to share it. And she said, oh, I, that's a misunderstanding. I didn't know about that. I'll talk to him tomorrow and we'll figure it out because you should have access. And he seemed reluctant to let it go. Like he thought maybe there was something else going on there that he wasn't totally trusting uh, that he was going to get the info. So that's why I mentioned it seems like Justin Barrett still has a role to play in this story. Um, there were other things she mentioned about um, past discussions of the site, some of which there are documents you can find online about, some of which you can't. Um, so I don't think we got a totally clear picture of the mayor. Oh, and she also managed mentioned that she has a list of buildings that she does want to have preserved. Um, that's a separate part of her process. And one of those she wants to turn into two units of affordable housing, which is huge to know that they actually are planning housing on the site. I don't know why only two units. It's a huge site. It seems like we could do better than two units. But she brought up a lot of information um, from past discussions about this that I don't think the public had during that meeting in January where everybody was upset with the recreation engineer who wanted to move forward on this. It seems like a lot of that 
that conflict could have been avoided if there were just um, if the mayor were just answering more questions about what her intentions are for the site. In her mind, this is already public, but it was publicized like 10, 15 years ago. People who are becoming concerned about the issue now really don't know a lot about what was going on. And that was one of the big takeaways um, from this meeting. Um, James and Chris, any comments? This kind of puts it into a different light, like when Darcy was trying to push for uh, the bus extension up Propeller Road, because this entire site is entirely accessible from a uh, yet unconstructed road to Forest Street and Trapello Road exclusively, and there is no public transit access at all for it's like an outdoor space that's only accessible by car from like two roads <laughs> from like the north side of Waltham. It's kind of there's an electric place. train. What does that mean? But what it's on it? site. I think it's like a close. <laughs> yeah, but loop. I'm so curious what electric train means and what does it do for the site. Yeah, and well, it's too bad there are a lot of things on the map like, wait, what is that? And we don't know. And that's what that presentation back in January was supposed to be about, but it got hijacked by all these concerns about the memorial just because in some of those concerns we now know were already being addressed, but the, we just don't aren't being told how. So, so yeah. it's disappointing that there's so much conflict that could have been pre prevented um, just by sharing more information about this with the public. Yeah, that's what I'm confused about because this it's such a difference from like one year ago or one and a half years ago, maybe two now, um, where we had a fernal reuse committee in the city council and we used to talk about what was going on with the fernal and it hasn't met in like over a year. It hasn't even been assigned committee members um, this session, um, which is almost going to be over at this point. Um, and and so when the last time I public I knew public information about the fernal, it was you know we were still talking about whether or not we should do an environmental study, and now all of a sudden there's an entire plan that's already accepted. I mean I feel like I'm like way unqualified to like give my analysis of this plan. I think it looks awesome, but I don't know enough about um, parks and disability advocate advocacy to say if this is um this is good, but it looks good to me. Yeah, I feel the same way. I was like really happy to see the plan, but then there are all these questions it raises where I'm like, but what about this? What I mean, one issue I'd heard people raise is it seemed like a lot of parking lot, a lot of pavement, but that might be necessary since you can't get there on the bus and we don't know, we might be getting a bus there, but we might not. And then, if, you know, maybe there's a better way to deal with that because it's a huge piece of land that lots of people could use, but access is going to determine how many people actually use it, I think. So I will qualify. It is not entirely fair to say that it's, there's no public transit access because it is relatively close to the T stop in Belmont down the street, but you, that does require having to walk up Trapello. So. One other thing I wanted to mention in relation to this, because I wanted to, it came out of the budget hearing and I didn't bring it up then because we had so many other things to bring up from the budget hearing. But in one of them, a counselor asked the mayor, I heard that the social media coordinator position is going to be moved out of IT into another department. And she said, what? No, that's not how, what are you talking about? Of course it's in IT, it's an IT function. You know, some people thought it should be in my office, but I disagreed with that, which I thought was kind of funny. That's an old fashioned way to look at social media, right? Like just because they use a computer, it's an IT function. Like the tree warden has an online database of trees. So like, should he be in the IT department? And like the assessor has an online day. So anyways, the, I think they, so for those who don't know, they hired a social media convert coordinator, I think a little over a year ago, and I think she does a good job. There's been a lot mm -hmm. more content coming out. But she the thing up. is, yeah, the thing is, though, that person, in order to figure out what to post, they have to go around to every department head and try to get their understanding of what they are allowed to share online, what they want to share online, what's the message they're trying to give online. And that is not a coordinator job. That building consensus on how a government wants to communicate with the public, that's something the mayor should be doing or she should hire a higher level person like a director, communications director, communications manager to do that, because that's a big job. And if it were done right, it would eliminate a lot of these things. Like if people were saying, oh, the mayor doesn't have a plan for the fernal, they could just post the mayor's plan for the fernal. You know, there could be a department that does that, but they have. So I think whoever is our next mayor needs to hire a communications director, whether that's promoting the social media person or hiring someone with experience to be her boss. I think that 
that's really lacking in City Hall. And it seems like the mayor has a kind of old fashioned way of thinking about how that's supposed to work. And yeah, uh, that's our last issue for today. Anything, anything, any final words? A special uh, rules and ordinances committee meeting on August 22nd for the pod shops at 6 p.m. And the regular city council returns September 12th. Okay, and we will be back next week. We don't know what we'll be talking about yet, but something, and I'm so glad we had Emily on. Uh, she was great. I hope we bring her back again soon. Um, so thank you, Chris and James. Thank you. Bye, everyone.